Okay, so let us now work through this judgment. This is a House of Lords judgment, and we know it's a House of Lords judgment because it says so at the top, House of Lords. Remember, we no longer have a House of Lords. We have the Supreme Court. So this was a judgment that was reached before the Supreme Court became effective in 2009. We also know that it is a criminal law case, and we know that because we have Regina here. Regina, you will see in a lot of criminal law case citations. If you don't see Regina, you see R. This Regina or R means that it's a criminal law case because the case is brought on behalf of the state and Regina really means the crown. So criminal law cases are technically brought on behalf of the state um, because when we commit a crime, we commit crimes against the state. So you may commit a crime um, and the crime obviously will physically affect another human being. But when you are charged in a criminal court, you're charged as though you have committed a crime against the state because that's how the law recognizes it. And you'll see Regina or sometimes you'll just see R, which is short for Regina. So we have Regina and Burke. That's one appellant. And we know that the case was previously in the Court of Appeal because it says on appeal from the Court of Appeal Criminal Division. Burke, though, is not the only appellant. The others are Ho, Bannister, and there is one more. I'll just scroll down a bit. The other one is Clarkson. So they're all criminal law cases and they have all been dealt with at trial in a Crown Court. And then they went to the Court of Appeal Criminal Division. And now the Court of Appeal Criminal Division has passed it on to the House of Lords. And that's why the House of Lords is involved in it, because the Court of Appeal Criminal Division has said, you need to deal with this case. Um, these cases, we have a few questions relating to the law, which are of public importance, which you need to clarify. Now, which judges were involved in this decision in the House of Lords? They were the following. So we have the Lord Chancellor, Lord Bridge of Harwich, Lord Brandon of Oakbrook, Lord Griffiths, Lord Mackay of Clashfern. And as we go through the judgment, you'll see that each of these um, judges has provided their decision and their opinions with regard to this case. The first one on the list is the Lord Chancellor. And when we look here, we see a different name. Be not confused. It's the same person. We're talking about the Lord Hailsham of Mer Marylebone. So what does he say? Let us have a look at it briefly. Lord Hailsham of Marylebone starts off by telling us that these appeals arise from two cases, one originating from a trial in the Manchester Crown Court. Those are the appeals um, of Ho and Bannister. Remember, we had a few appellants that we identified at the top of the document. Two of those were first tried in the Manchester Crown Court. And then we have Burke and Clarkson, which are other appellants, and they were charged in the Central Criminal Crown Court. So that is the Old Bailey in London. Now, what were these individuals tried for? I'm going to give you just a little bit of information about their, um, their cases so that you can understand the case a little bit, but we won't go into too much detail because the focus of this course is not criminal law, but rather for you to get a good understanding of what a judgment looks like and what the different parts of the judgment are. So, so far we can see that the Lord Hailsham of St. Marylebone has been given us facts of the case, right? And I'm going to just give you a, a run through of what those are. But if we, I scroll down a little bit, you'll see that here he's telling us what happened with Ho and Bannister, why they were tried, you know, and what happened at trial. So you can see that a judgment doesn't just include the ratio decidendi because so far this judge is not giving us the ratio decidendi of the case. He's telling us what happened. He's giving us some facts. So what happened? Hall and Bannister were tried with two other defendants and they were tried at the Manchester Crown Court. What were Hall and Bannister tried for? They were tried for murder in the Manchester um, Crown Court. And they were tried with these two defendants, murder, Murray and Bailey. Now, Murray and Bailey are not appellants in this case. And let me explain why. When Ho and Bannister were tried with Murray and Bailey, Ho and Bannister argued that the reason for their killing Murray and Bailey was because they thought that if they did not kill Murray and Bailey, they were going to kill them. So they were in effect using the defense of 
duress at trial. Ho and Bannister and Marion Bailey actually killed two men and tried to kill another person. For the murder of one man, the judge said the defense of duress was permitted. For the killing of another man, the judge at trial said the defense of duress was not permitted. And for the plan or conspiracy to kill the third man, the judge said duress was permitted. Now, what is duress? Duress is the defense that Ho and Bannister were using. So their defense was, listen, we only killed these two men because if we hadn't done it, Murray and Bailey would have killed us. That is their defense of duress, or that was their defense of duress. Now, when we say that the Crown Court judge allowed the defense, what we mean is the Crown Court judge turned to the jury and said, you can listen to that and you can take that into account when you're reaching your decision. For the murder of the first man, the judge said, you can take that defense into consideration, jury. For the defense of the second man, the murder of the second man, the judge said, you cannot take into consideration. And for the conspiracy to kill the third man, you can take their defense of duress into consideration. After all of that, the jury still decided that the men were guilty of murder. So why did Ho and Bannister appeal? And why is their appeal now in the House of Lords after it being dealt with in the Court of Appeal Criminal Division? Ho and Bannister argued that when the Crown Court judge said their defense of duress would not be recognized or listened to by the jury for the second murder, they said that was incorrect. They argued that their defense of duress should have been permitted. So they're saying that the judge should have told the jury to take that into consideration. And they also argued that when the judge said the defense of duress was permitted for the murder of the first man and for the plan to kill the third man, even though the judge allowed the jury to take it into consideration, the judge gave the jury an objective test. And according to Ho and Bannister's legal representatives, the judge should have given the jury a subjective test to work with. So that is why they appealed to the Court of Appeal Criminal Division. The Court of Appeal Criminal Division dismissed their appeals, but the Court of Appeal Criminal Division asked the House of Lords to clarify particular questions. Why did they ask them this? They said, well, let's turn to this part of the judgment. This is still Lord Hailsham of Marylebone giving us some information about the appellants, right? So he says the four current appellants appealed against their convictions to the Court of Appeal who dismissed all four appeals in a judgment delivered in 21st January 1986. In giving leave to appeal to your lordships, the House, the Court of Appeal, certified three questions of law of general public importance as involved in the decision. So the Court of Appeal said these questions are of general public importance. We really need you to clarify this piece of law. It is quite important that we get clarification from you, the highest court in the land, as to what the answers to the following questions are. Something to note though, so far I've only discussed Paul and Bannister's case with you, but I haven't discussed um, Burr and Clarkson. So let's have a look at the facts of Burke and Clarkson's case. So remember, Burke and Clarkson's case is a separate one, which was heard in the Central Criminal Court or the Old Bailey, whereas Holland Bannisters and Marion Bailey, those their case was heard in the Manchester Crown Court. What happened with Clarkson and Burke? Well, Clarkson and Burke were in the Old Bailey charged for murder. The actual killer in the case was Burke, but Burke's defense at trial was, again, duress. Burke argued that he killed the victim because if he had not killed the victim, Clarkson would have killed him. What was Clarkson's defense? Clarkson's defense was that he had nothing to do with it at all. Do, do with it at all. He had nothing to do with the situation at all. This was not bought by the court and there was a further appeal to the Court of Appeal Criminal Division as with Ho and Bannister. Why did they appeal and why are their cases here in the House of Lords? Well, Burke appealed because he argued that the judge at trial told the jury 
that the defense of duress was not available to him as he was the actual killer in the crime. So the first question that the House of Lords needs to answer is here. Is duress available as a defense to a person charged with murder as a principal in the first degree? This question was relevant to both Home Bannister's case and to Burke's situation. The Court of Appeal Criminal Division passed it on to the House of Lords because they felt that this and the other two questions were of general importance for the public. We really needed clarification on what the law meant or what the law stated on this point. So that's the first question that this judgment will give us an answer to. The other two questions are, can one who incites or procures by duress another to kill or be party to a killing, be convicted of murder if that person is acquitted by reason of duress. This second question is really re was really relevant for Clarkson because Clarkson wanted to know if Burke gets acquitted, meaning he's not found guilty of murder, right? If his verdict was reversed and he was acquitted, so he wasn't guilty of murder, would I still be convicted of murder as I was the person who is said to have incited him into doing the crime. So Clarkson's appeal really rested on a change in Burke's situation. So that's why, that's how Clarkson gets into the story with regard to the appeal. And the third question, does the defense of duress fail if the prosecution prove that a person of reasonable firmness sharing the characteristics of the defendant would not have given way to the threats as did the defendant, is related to the objective test that the judge in Ho and Bannister used when they permitted the use of duress for the killing of the first victim. So when they actually permitted the use of duress, they used the objective test. The court is also being asked here, is that objective test correct? Right? Is that test that they use actually correct? Now, for this case, the main question is really the first question. The main question was, is duress available as a defense to a person charged with murder? And but, a, but an answer to each question was given in the judgment. What we're going to do now is identify the answers to those questions and then also try to identify the ratio decidendi in this case. So now let's have a look to see what each judge said to each question. We're starting off with Lord Helsham on page five. Lord Helsham decides to start with answering question three, and he does it here. He says that, I believe that of my noble and learned friends, the definition of duress, whether applicable to murder or not, was correctly stated by both trial judges to contain an objective element. So he's saying that when the judges apply the objective element or a, a, an objective test to duress in the Manchester Crown Court and in the Central Criminal Court in London or the Old Bailey, they were correct in their doing so. So he's saying yes to question three. On page 14, we find his answers to questions one and two. So you can see that Lord Helsham made quite a lengthy contribution to this judgment. I'm just scrolling through to page 14, where we find his answers to questions one and two. From page nine, page 10. So here we have Lord Helsham's answers. And he says here, I consider that the appeal should be dismissed and the certified questions answered respectively. One to number, no to number one, yes to number two, and yes to number three. So now let's have a look at Lord Bridges' contribution to the discussion. Lord Bridges' contribution starts here, and we're going to go to the top of page 16. And this is where he starts discussing question one. And, you know, he uses different cases in his discussion, but eventually he agrees with the other judges. And he says that his answer to question one is no. And then at the end, of his discussion, he gives us his answers for questions two and three. So they are yes and yes, right? He says, I would answer to the second and third questions certified, the third certified questions in the affirmative. And after Lord Bridge comes Lord Brandon of Oakbrook, Oakbrook and he gives us his answers 
very quickly because this is a short contribution he also says no yes yes so his is a shorter contribution all here so now let's have a look at lord griffith's contribution to the discussion and if we turn to page 23 of this document we will see his contribution so i'm going to scroll down to page 23 and go to the last paragraph that's where we'll find his answers here lord griffith says my lords in in my view we should accept the advice of the lord chief justice and the justices who sat with him and decline to extend the defense to the actual killer so this is the answer to question one he's saying no he does go on to say yes at to the second question and yes to the third question and that is found in the last paragraph of his contribution, which is here. So I have had the advantage of reading the speeches of the Lord Chancellor and Lord Mackay of Clashford, and I agree with the opinions they have expressed on the second and third questions raised before your Lordships. So he's saying yes and yes to the second and third questions. Now, Lord Mackay is our last judge on the list, and his decision is found on page 40. So let's go to page 40 at the end we'll see that lord mckay says he also considers that these appeals should be dismissed and the first certified question answered in the negative no and the second and third in the affirmative yes so so far we've gone through the document and we've seen the facts of the case involved in the judgment we've seen the judge's decisions now we need to decide where the ratio decidendi is now, as you've seen in the document, there is nowhere in there where it is stated ratio decidendi. That is not stated in the document at all. In some of the newer, more recent judgments, there is the ratio decidendi is clearly outlined so that it's easy for us to identify it. But with some of the older judgments, including this one, it has been left to legal experts and um, legal professionals to identify what the what the ratio decidendi is now remember ratio decidendi is not just the decision but rather it's the reasoning behind the decision so what were the judges thinking what legal principles did they apply in order to reach their decision and if we go to lord griffith's contribution we will find the ratio decidendi for this case so let's do that together in this paragraph here lord griffiths tells us against this background are there any present circumstances that should impel your lordships to alter the law that has stood for so long and to extend the duress defense of duress to the actual killer my lords i can think of none he says it appears to me that all present indications point in the opposite direction we face a rising tide of violence and terrorism against which the law must stand firm recognizing that its high highest duty is to protect the freedom and lives of those that live under it the sanctity of human life lies at the root of this ideal and i would do nothing to undermine it be it ever so slight so the reasoning behind the decision or one of them is that there is a particular sanctity of life human life and that the law needs to recognize that and the judges are arguing that in their deciding that duress is not available when someone is on trial for murder they are respecting human life and the value of human life so there we've identified the ratio decidendi right so we found the facts we found the um the decisions the decision was to dismiss the appeal and they answered the certified questions no to question one yes to question two yes to question three and then when this decision is to be applied in other courts now in the crown court the judges need to bear in mind what was decided in this case and they need to also bear in mind the reasoning behind the judge's decision which is the ratio decidendi so murder is not available duress is not available as a defense to murder and the reasoning behind it is that human life is of um, significant value and it is not to be um it is to be protected by the courts if we were to read the judgment together in more detail we would also see that a lot of the arguments posed by many of the judges in this judgment is that it is up to parliament to change the law the law commission had suggested that the law should be changed but parliament had not done anything in response to it 
So the, a lot of the judges in this judgment did argue that considering Parliament was made aware that the Law Commission wanted to change the law and they haven't done it, it is not for them as judges to change the law. Because clearly, they, one of the judges argues, clearly, if the public wanted the law to be changed, Parliament would have responded to it. So there's also that as well, which influenced their decision. Now, let us look for some obiter dicta. A lot of commentary has been made, right? A lot of what we've seen on this document or what we can see on this document is the facts of the case, other um, previous decisions that were reached, and, and, and the judges make comparisons between those decisions and this decision. But what we're going to try and find now is what is, is a particular piece of obiter dicta that was made in this judgment. And normally when we study law, we are told that obiter dicta is not binding precedent, and pers but it is persuaded, persuasive precedent. And we are often told as law students that in judgments, sometimes judges will make comments or comments about hypothetical situations. And that when they make these hypothetical, um, when they make comments about these hypothetical situations in judgments, these hypothetical situations are not binding. They are not binding precedent, but they are persuasive precedent. Okay. Now let's go through the document and identify a piece of persuasive precedent. Now we've been through the document and as you can see, it's 40 pages long. It is a lengthy document. A lot of the commentary is that of, which relates to the facts of the case, previous decisions. But if we look very closely, there is also a comment made about attempted murder, which is not binding, but is a piece of persuasive precedent. And I'm going to identify that for you. And then we're going to explore why that is persuasive and why it is not binding. So that piece of persuasive precedent is found in Lord Griffith's commentary as well. Let's scroll through and find that. Here he says, and declare the law to be that duress is not available as a defense to a charge of murder or attempted murder. Which part is obiter dicta? The part when he says, the part in which he says, or attempted murder, that is obiter dicta. That is not binding. Why is it not binding? Because this case did not include people being charged for attempted murder. So this is a piece of Obiter dicta is a piece of persuasive precedent, other things said. However, it's coming from the House of Lords, so it is highly persuasive. So it means that judges in the Crown Court may well follow it. But the, the, but the beginning of this statement is binding. This is the precedent, remember? And declare the law to be that duress is not available as a defense to a charge of murder, because this is what the case was about. This case was about murder but attempted murder, it was not about. So therefore, this is a piece of obiter dicta. So you can see what we mean in class when we say, oh, um, sometimes judges have come up with these hypothetical situations, but those are not binding precedent. Those are persuasive precedent. They are obiter dicta, other things said.